still not perfectly okay, so I will figure out myself uh, a lot during this lecture. Uh, but hopefully we will. <coughs> yeah, that's my plan. But hopefully we will manage to uh, be, or I will manage to be clear enough uh, so you actually understand what uh, this lecture is all about. But before we uh, begin the lecture, I uh, have a quick uh, maybe, uh, announcement or request to make. Uh, you see, I am currently selling my car. And I was thinking that you might help me. Uh, yeah, if some company is better, maybe you can just say it. Uh, basically, it's a seven year old Opel Astra with, with 80,000 uh, kilometers mileage. And I was wondering uh, what would be a reasonable price for that. What would you think? Seven year old car. 80,000 years mileage. Uh, 80,000 uh, kilometers mileage. Because the problem is, as you might expect, that uh, if we uh, set the initial price too high, then nobody will buy the price. Uh, so we will lose that. And if the price will be low, then yeah, we will be really selling. We will be happy, but would we be actually uh, happy about it? Because if we sell it too quickly, then it probably means that the price was too low, right? So, how would you help me approach this issue? So, mm -hmm. you mean first and not second, uh, after the similar offer? So, so basically, I should probably uh, look uh, on the market and check similar cars, right? So, I did just that. Uh, and as you can see, uh, here is on the x axis, you see mileage, and on the y axis, you see prices. And these are all Opel Astras uh, from Okomoko uh, currently as, as they stand right now. Maybe not right now, but let's say a few weeks ago. And my car is here. So probably it would be reasonable to uh, say that 65,000 would be okay, right? But the mileage is not enough because we also have the age of the car, right? Uh, so I did just the same for, <coughs> for the age, and this is what I got. And my car is 70 old, which is here. So right here, we should probably say that it's around 40,000. So already we have two contradicting answers. Which of them would you prefer, 65 or 40? Or Just take value in between, right? Um, do we have any other reasons? Maybe use more parameters by the condition of the car. Add more parameters, this will actually compl uh, complicate our problem because we will have even more uh, parameters to fit. And probably uh, we would even have maybe uh, <coughs> a very good quality car. With very high price. Uh, actually, most of the new cars are very high, uh, let's say, overall quality, uh, where the price of the hotel was not enough. The ceiling is very high. And there are some cars which are of the really good quality out there. So it's spread a little bit higher. Uh, 
down. So 50 seems like a good number. <coughs> and this thing, right? uh, however, there is a catch here. Because if you are looking only for neighbors, imagine what would happen if my car would be here. And right next to uh, this new spot, we have 25,000 cars. And there is clearly something wrong with it. So we can see an outlier, which would clearly uh, affect how we are looking at the car that we want to sell. <coughs> so looking at just the closest value might not be a bad option. But what we are trying to do is kind of estimate a function that is defined on this space. <coughs> and this is regression test. By the way, I'm not selling my car, so to be clear. Of course, uh, we don't uh, still see all the contributing factors because the cars can have different versions of equipment or different generations. You might get uh, manual or automatic reports. Uh, you might get different levels of general wear, right? You might, uh, the prices can be affected by geographical factors. So it's uh, easier to sell a car in a big city, it's much harder to sell a car uh, far from, from the big city, right? So, all of these can be included in our analysis as additional features. However, this would probably mean that we would need to get more and more data samples in order to make this feature space uh, defensive of environment policy. So, if we want to fill the feature space, then maybe any inferences based on all these additional factors, we probably need to have more uh, and more data samples. However, uh, the point is that uh, you basically uh, had an example of regression in practice. Uh, so we can ignore the mileage and the price and just treat it as uh, a general problem. We have some features, we have some data samples, and we have one feature which we call the target value. And the task of regression is to tell us what is the expected target value depending on where you are on this x-axis. And by the way, this can, uh, this can be a vector. So you can have a lot of features here, just before us with the uh, combined mileage and age of the car. <coughs> so the goal of progression is to find a function, an underlying function f of x, uh, which defines uh, where the, let's say, where we have the highest likelihood of data uh, based on some samples. Uh, and this x can be a vector of index. Uh, it does not need to be just one uh, particular value. Uh, and as you might expect, or, some, or as you might remember from our previous course, uh, we can build models uh, belonging to two different Categories. So we can have linear models or we can have non-linear models. Linear models uh, for one-dimensional problem are just straight lines. So our model is a straight line that defines where we need more data. Uh, for the generalized high-dimensional uh, problem, it would be a hyperplane. Uh, however, uh, for non-linear models, uh, for one-dimensional uh, example, we have just a curve defined by some equation, and for uh, more than, uh, actually, uh, for three uh, dimensions and higher, meaning that all uh, feature and target dimensions, and in terms of just number of uh, features, just for 2D class, uh, it would be a surface. So we call this uh, this structure a surface. So uh, hyperplane is linear and surface is nonlinear. Uh, and here you can see examples for one feature dimension. <coughs> Just as in our previous course, we would be using this one-dimensional example to kind of show you the basic ideas. However, in your uh, tasks, in your cases, you will be usually using a lot of feature dimensions. Uh, and for a linear model, uh, 
we just have a general equation of W times X plus B. Uh, you can see the color codes, the, the blue uh, color uh, corresponding to features. So something that you put into your model in order to get target value. While uh, model parameters are orange, and this is something that you uh, derive from training. So uh, feeding the model means finding these orange parameters. And if you have more than just one feature dimension, it looks just like this. So the general form is the same, but you have more than one X feature, and therefore you have more than one uh, way to uh, And this is why this is bold, because this represents a vector. This is bold because this is a vector. And right here, we have just values, particular variables for particular dimensions of things. <sighs> and note, that this function is actually a function of x and w. But x is used uh, to get all of the data points in our model, and w uh, is defined as model parameters. Okay? And for nonlinear models, we have the same general form of all the functions. So we again have a function of w for model parameters and x's, so inputs. Uh, but the relationship will be nonlinear one, and uh, further in this lecture, you will learn what are the basic, <coughs> basic examples of nonlinear models that we would use. So, we have our generalized model. Uh, and in order to kind of define formally what we just did, uh, a regression means that uh, we want to find a model estimate the relationship between one data variable and the others. So this y is this one data variable that we want to estimate, and the uh, x uh, are the other variables that we measure. Uh, the y is usually called target value, uh, but it can also be called uh, dependent variable because it depends on the axis, uh, outcome or response. Or sometimes it's even called label. I don't like label because it's, uh, um, the label belongs to classification, so label means uh, what's in the class below. And a lot of people call uh, Y label here, so if you wouldn't understand it like that, you wouldn't understand what, uh, what was meant by it. Uh, please do not refer to Y as label during this course. Okay? It's just so you will understand maybe some other text that you might find. I am usually using either target or outcome, <coughs> but dependent variable and response are for sure the way I go. Xs uh, are usually called features, but also you can call them independent variables, uh, explanatory variables, because they explain what y should be uh, spec uh, inputs or predictors. <coughs> I usually use either features or inputs. Uh, and finally, y's, uh, w, sorry, uh, these are model parameters. They are often referred to as weights, especially in neural networks. Uh, sometimes they are also called unknown parameters, uh, which is a bit ambiguous, I would say, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. And very often, they are denoted as betas. I would even say that you would find betas more often than w. Uh, however, during this course, we are using W because uh, then, as you start to learn neural networks, you have this uh, strange uh, feeling that yeah, this is basically the same parameter, but it was called uh, beta before and now it's called W. So I use W from start because then it's easier to understand and it's kind of uh, all fit in the same uh, place. Actually, also uh, using uh, w from start that allows you to have a smoother transition into neural networks. You might remember from our previous course uh, where you uh, you define linear classifiers. Uh, you did you did this uh, managed to uh, have really nice classification, and then you learned that you actually implemented neural networks. You remember it was this maybe eye-opener moment during our previous course. Uh, I mean the signal uh, processing, of course. <coughs> and this is possible because we are using uh, as well as 
language to work with us. <coughs> okay. uh, in general, we want to minimize error between non targets Y and you have you can see capital Y here because we are talking about a whole set of different Ys. So for all the samples we have target values and therefore we are referring to here uh, to capital Y because it contains a lot of these small Ys for individual uh, samples. And targets are predicted by known for a known set of input data X, capital X, because again we can have a whole set of data here, not just one sample. This would be referred to as uh, small X by adjusting all the parameters W. And W is non capital Y. Because we have just one vector of W for one particular model. We don't have separate vectors for W for every separate uh, data sample. So our Ys and Xs contain a data set of samples, while W is just a vector uh, which says how the model behaves for this whole data set. And now, in order to fit this model, so to learn what W you should have, uh, so the model will be doing your version properly, <coughs> we can use, for example, this first minimization. We can, it's not the only solution out there, okay? But for now, we will be using actually this first minimization. And now, how to understand this notation? R means W means that we are uh, aiming to find the W which would minimize this equation. So we are looking for such W for all the axes and the targets corresponding to these axes that this statement would be minimal. And now see that this statement means what our function returns. This is our basic model, right? Uh, subtracted from what we would expect Square. So this is this squares minimization. Why do we have square here? Not just absolute value. First of all, because it's mathematically convenient. A lot of uh, computations uh, are just simple because of this square. Uh, for example, uh, if you are calculating derivative, then uh, this might be uh, kind of connects to other. Algorithms that are out there, and also because it already covers the problem with positive and negative values, and finally because we usually are more interested in uh, large errors than small ones. So, this is a problem. All of this, not so much. And this is why we are using this square. The square of the error uh, tells us that the higher the error is, the more it stands out in our uh, function. Okay, so uh, we have the basics already covered. So now let's dive into some particular algorithms for doing regression. And the first one, <coughs> the simplest one, although for many practical situations, it is enough. Uh, it's linear regression. So imagine we have a data set. Uh, and into this data set, we want to fit a line. So we want to find such line that minimizes this number, these uh, squares of errors. So uh, these green vertical uh, lines represent these errors. We square them in order to and we want to find such a position for this blue line, so this sum of squares would be uh, as small as possible. <coughs> Our model is just an equation for a straight line. So we have W1 times X, because we have just one feature in this example, plus WB, which is 
bias person, we often call it like that. Uh, in here, this is just uh, a statement for how high is our line with respect to the x-axis. And we do model fitting, so uh, we are using the same equation as before, but right now, instead of uh, general function equation, we just ask here our function, so our model, which we can see here. And we are doing that, and this will give us the position of our line. Okay. Here. So, uh, we have um, a really nice solution to many regression problems. However, what to do if our problem looks like this? Right now, we can't actually use <coughs> a straight line in order to model the whole data set, right? So we would probably need uh, a non-linear solution. But we can actually use a linear model for that, provided that we will change uh, the way it is uh, fitted. So we will change uh, our goal of simulation. Because actually, uh, this line serves not for modeling all of the data, but just to tell us what is the expected target value for particular value of x. So maybe we could use this model, uh, but we would feel it differently. Let's consider that we have this data set, and we ask what will be happening for this value of x. So we want to do regression with respect to this model. And now, probably, some of the points will be more important than others, and these green ones here, in this uh, ellipse, <coughs> is something that we should consider primarily, right? So, we could just take a neighborhood of our x of interest, and use only points from this neighborhood in order to fit this line. So, this orange or red points, uh, in the red case we will ignore, and we will just use the neighbors of our x of interest. Does this remind you of something? So our line will look like this. Do you have any, uh, do you know any other any classification method that was used in similar principles? For this case, we will have these neighbors for this x we have the neighbors at the top. And as you can see, this line pretty well covers the area where we want this, uh, where we want the data to be modeled. Which classification algorithm was using this in our principles? It was something like a uh, k neighbors algorithm. Exactly, k neighbors neighbors uh, told us to basically ignore all the data which are far away from our sample and only use neighborhood of this sample in order to get some uh, knowledge about uh, what to do with this sample, right? Uh, do you remember what were the drawbacks of this method? Or anyone else? Up until x, uh, I, uh, and to 
each of these points, we are assigning uh, some weights. And we are using the grid letter tau in order to define the neighborhood. And we are doing this, or we are assigning these weights according to this equation. So we have t to the power of, and look that this is x t, so our point of interest, and this is x i. So <coughs> weight is assigned to a particular data sample, and the distance between our point of interest and the data sample uh, is used to uh, say how this point influences our computation. And in order to uh, understand how, uh, how we can adjust the width of this uh, ellipse, uh, this is a plot that shows you uh, how this weight is assigned depending on different tiles. Uh, and basically, the farther you go from our point of interest, the less and less important uh, all these points become. And now we are using exactly the same equation as before in order to fit our line, with the exception that we are multiplying the errors, the squares errors, by our weight. And that's it. And it works really nicely. Is this clear to us how, how this all <coughs> okay. As we said, it is nice, but it requires calculation of a regression model each time we need an answer. So it's not viable if we need our method to be quick or memory efficient. <coughs> and that is all regarding uh, what linear models so, uh, we need to dig deeper in order to actually solve uh, more complex problems. Uh, so, the first question is how do we know that we actually need a nonlinear model? Uh, and we could measure a fitting error, right? So, the higher the error is, uh, the more we are likely to need a nonlinear model, right? That's okay. So, I let you into a trap because, think about it. Uh, imagine this model. The nonlinear model might probably have a lot of errors, right? But, imagine this model. They both have a similar error. In the top example, we actually need the nonlinear model. In the bottom example, we don't need the nonlinear model. <coughs> Even if we get very advanced model here, you can't get any better with this data than we are already. So, the just measuring fitting error is not enough to tell you that you need to look for more advanced solutions. You actually need to test more advanced solutions and check if it helps. So, <coughs> let's assume that we are indeed fitting nonlinear models into our data. And in the top example, yeah, the error was decreased significantly, while in the bottom example, it didn't help. So you never know a priori whether you should use a linear model. You always need to just test it and check if it helps or not. And if yes, then okay, we are doing a linear model in the future for this particular data task. If not, then we are getting back to a simpler version, because we always need to find the simplest solution possible for any problem. <coughs> yeah, so we are just trying the non-linear model and then checking if it helps, and if yes, then we are happy, if not, then we are uh, reverting back to a linear one. So, since we are talking about linear models and we want to test them, we want to evaluate whether they help or not, let's think about how to define them. And there are plenty of different ways of building nonlinearities into our functions. But we won't cover all of them, we won't even cover, I don't know, 10% of them. These are just examples, okay? So it's not everything that is out there, but this will give you, uh, let's say, a basic outlook on the field and maybe the ability to use the most popular solutions uh, that are, I think, in most of the data science, toolboxes, libraries, and so on. <laughs> then let's start with the polynomial model. Uh, and I think that you might be familiar with that 
already uh, because uh, it is often used uh, to feed, let's say, some model into any data. Uh, you might have used it on any of the other laboratories, for instance, as well. And for example, uh, linear mode is one example of polynomial modes, right? Just the ordinary first one. But adding uh, another terms into our polynomial just makes the model more linear. And the more terms we add, the more complex our model uh, becomes, right? So for the quadratic model, we are feeding either straight line into our data or quadratic function, right? The more terms we add, the more complex this line becomes. <coughs> and again, note that uh, these are bolded w's and x's because uh, this refers to the uh, vectors of values. It's easy to model. It's easy to Should we have one? B or a vector of this. So we 
look at this mode, this uh, middle lines are low and these uh, thin lines uh, above and below are parallel to this line and they are just uh, to show you how, uh, how far our data points are from our mode. Uh, and here in, uh, we can see another point. Which of them is better? Actual model, 
So we are using a function, a kernel, that not linearly maps our data into new space in such a way that in this new space they become linear. This is a bit like magic, and this is why it is called a kernel trick. Uh, kernel k maps data not linearly into space with higher number of dimensions. Uh, and how to imagine this? Uh, think about your nonlinear example. And now think about the globe. And you take your nonlinear example and you try to stretch it on this globe in such a way that this data will actually form a straight line once you rotate your globe. And this is the idea that I will uh, <coughs> leave you with for this lecture uh, because the kernel trick is much easier to, to comprehend using classification uh, SDS. So we will be covering next time classification SDS. I will explain to you how the kernel trick works with that and then we will go back to the question and explain uh, how actually you are defining kernels and how you are configuring them and how it actually allows to work. Uh, right now, just remember this general idea and we will cover it uh, next time in, in greater detail. Okay? <coughs> Any questions about this yes, so far? So, artificial neural network. And this is again something that you know already. Uh, but uh, let's keep focused because what I want to do today is to show you a different way of thinking about neural networks. So you already learned one explanation uh, a year ago, right? And right now we will be talking about different way of thinking about neural networks. So the math will be, uh, will, uh, will be the same as before, but we will approach it differently. And hopefully this will get you uh, a bit more understanding and more ability to actually move this model in your head and understand it from different perspectives. So, the idea here is that we need to have a non-linear function. And uh, thinking about how to define such a function is pretty complex. So, let's say that we have a data set. Uh, 
and fill with that equation for this uh, shape. You can have different functions. You can use rectified linear elements, of course. You know them already. Uh, there are many others. There are, for example, radial based functions. So, they look like this. Spoiler, we will revisit them uh, next time when we will be talking about advanced neural network structures and support vector machines. You don't need to remember them for now, but I'm just showing you different ways or different nonlinearities that can be covered <coughs> by our models. <coughs> so what we do, if we are using we are usually giving just one type of nonlinearity. So for example, the Sigoid function. And we are decomposing our D function into a set of these small uh, functions. So this is why we have here these sigmas, uh, and they have parameters, so our x uh, times w1 plus some bias, and this is basically how the neural network works. Uh, so let's think about what is going on within the neural So we need just one of these sigma functions. We have our x's and our dimensions, of course. We have weights corresponding to these dimensions. We are cutting some bias. And we then pass it all into our sigma function <coughs> and our response, which we know as x prime here, uh, would be used to add all of the elements together. So this is one other element in vector, and then we would be adding all these elements. So here you've got a scheme for a neural network. And this is exactly what we just discussed. So we have x's and b as inputs. We have weights corresponding to particular x's and particular neurons. Each of the neurons here is just this one sigma, uh, uh, sigma expression here. <coughs> After weighted summation, we are passing it through our simple nonlinear function, and we have our vector of x prime, which are then summed again with a set of weights and passed as output. Here we have what two outputs, so we are doing a uh, regression for two values at the same time. You can do it for one, you can do it for two, you can do it for any number you want. <sighs> and of course, you can add more layers to that. So uh, each layer is just an added layer of abstraction of our reasoning. <coughs> so we are first moving our data from one space into uh, more abstract space and so on and so on. And finally, we have this summation or decomposition of function into singular components. It is more or less clear. How do you like this explanation of neural networks? A bit more mathematically focused. But uh, kind of tackling the problem from a different side than before. <coughs> so, you are not thinking about how to decompose neural network structure and understand what is going on. You are kind of thinking from the bottom up how to build a network structure so we will be able to, uh, to, to build this advanced nonlinear representation of our data. Okay, we will revisit neural network training algorithms next time in the classification lecture. Uh, right now, I want you to uh, remember and be able to explain this uh, way of thinking about neural networks. So the stuff that we just discovered. And let's do a quick summary of the models that we've learned so far. Uh, we have linear regression, which is simple, straightforward, quick. Uh, in vast majority of problems, I would say, uh, the linear regression is a really nice first step and already allows uh, to explain the vast majority of uh, uh, data diversity. So in typical problems, multidimensional linear regression is often the best solution. However, uh, if you want to work in data science, it is worth remembering that uh, linear regression not, uh, is not catchy. So uh, often uh, people uh, that are, let's say, presented with linear regression say, okay, but it's very simple algorithm, there is no artificial intelligence here, and so on and so on. 
Let us give it to our children because it's much more intelligent and so on. So instead of linear regression, you can always use a neural network with just one neuron. But what does one neuron do? A linear regression, right? So uh, if you see a very intelligent solution composing a neural network in order to inflate some data, it is often worthwhile to look into this network because often it can be just uh, replaced with a linear regression. We have a weighted linear regression, which is kind of a KNN classifier for regression purposes, uh, sharing the same advantages and disadvantages. So it's uh, it's really simple. It's able to simplify nonlinear problems into linear problems, which are computationally easy. Uh, however, it is slow and it is memory continuous. Uh, we have polynomial data. Uh, which is again simple, it is able to track uh, simple non simple nonlinear units in our data. Uh, if the model for our data is, uh, is not really that advanced, or actually if the arrangement for the data is not really that advanced, we can easily, we can easily use uh, polynomial models because they will just be sufficient enough. So, Often in your data, you will see something that looks, for example, like this. In many physical problems, now a linear model will not uh, help us to model that, right? But a simple polynomial. We have SVNs, uh, which uh, are uh, characterized by very quick learning. Uh, they are a bit tricky to configure, uh, but they can put scalability to high dimensional problems, and they are adjustable for applied because of this soft margin. So some of the points can be kind of ignored in computation. We will, we will dive into it uh, next week. So. And finally, we have artificial neural network, which is a universal solution. So no matter what is your regression problem, there exists a neural network that will be theoretically speaking able to solve that. However, uh, the training sometimes is slow and the configuration is really complex because usually you need to uh, solve this second order optimization problem <coughs> to define the neural network structure. Uh, any questions about the models? Let's say 
begin with first the most basic thing. Uh, so the data, uh, yeah, the, the most uh, the most flexibility in order to actually tell us something about the data. And as we are making our model more complex and more complex, uh, what would happen? At some point, we are usually able to grab the general characteristics of the data, but all the nuances are not modeled very well. So we can see that uh, here we can have, uh, you see a flat line, here we can see some kind of steps, maybe here is a dam, and our model just simplifies it all. Is it okay? Yeah, probably in many uh, circumstances. Uh, is it the optimal model? Probably not. Somewhere, as you are making your model more complex, <coughs> more and more complex, we hit uh, sweet spot. So, uh, a situation where uh, the model complexity perfectly reflects data, uh, and you are able to do it perfectly well here. Uh, if we go higher, uh, what would happen? Uh, first of all, we just have a model that is too complex, but the, the prediction error is not actually increasing. So if you look at this black line here, it's actually pretty similar to our previous model. It's not that more, uh, it's not that worse, right? But the model is not, uh, it has a bit of overhead, right? It has complexity uh, more uh, advanced than the structure of our data. And finally, as we go even higher, we start to risk overhead. So uh, the, the model will be able to actually memorize our data uh, and not generalize any longer. So the question is, how to set the complexity knowing what to expect uh, if the model is too complex or too simple? And, and there are actually three approaches to do so. The first one is the top-down approach, where we are starting from a really complex model, so for example, a big neural network, and then we are reducing its complexity, so <coughs> deleting neurons, uh, deleting layers, and so on, uh, until we see that uh, the overheating stops, and then later on, uh, then the uh, prediction error increases. And between this uh, overheating stops and prediction error increases is our system, right? So we are going from the top, as the earlier kind of approach is doing in the Or we can pick complexity based on data. Ten independent data samples uh, per adjustable parameter should guarantee that we will see an overview, provided that the data are actually independent, right? Uh, and this uh, is much faster because you just look at your data and say, okay, this model will be complex enough so that we wouldn't have overheat and uh, we should be able to probably uh, grasp the data uh, or grasp the uh, relationship with the data. But there is a risk in that, in there. While we are not actually uh, risking overheat very much, uh, there is a possibility that we just have a lot of data points uh, but the actual uh, structure in the data is linear. So, maybe you have a lot of data points, but they all form a perfect linear relationship. And now, using this approach, you would have uh, a model that actually uh, is an overview with respect to problem which you are able to solve. Because you just need a linear model, just one neuron. Uh, in your neural network. Uh, and still you are training your really large neural network, uh, you are doing a lot of configuration steps in order to make sure that there is no overhead and so on and so on. And a very simple solution would be that. So this is the risk associated with this uh, strategy. So the top strategy, the risk is that it's just time consuming. The middle strategy is that uh, you might end up with a model that is too complex for your data anyway. And the final strategy is that we can uh, start from the bottom up. So we are uh, using very simple models, so maybe just a linear one, or maybe a neural network with just one or two neurons. And then we are adding complexity until the model stops improving. Uh, can you think of 
about risk, risks associated with that. We are risking uh, that we hit the plateau. This is exactly the earlier question from before. So how do we know that we need to improve the model complexity if we actually don't see any improvement at all? And the improvement might happen as the complexity is high enough to actually grasp the data. So imagine it like If you hit a line, it will be just like that, right? If you hit a square function, it may be something like that, or, or maybe you know. And adding additional uh, layers of complexity do not change much until we hit actually complexity which allows you to build this model. So going from the bottom up, you are risking that you will actually get uh, maybe uh, discouraged, you will see that there is nothing going on in this data, and the actual complexity is just uh, farther, farther away from us. Is this clear for this? Perfect. Uh, so, let's, over, let's revisit overfitting already. <coughs> uh, let's revisit overfitting. You should already know it by heart. By now, we were covering this issue, I think, three times already during our previous uh, lectures, courses, and so on. So, what is overfitting? It's a memorization of data samples, right? So, the model learns by heart uh, all the data sample locations and is not actually able to generalize over them. And we recognize it by looking at the performance of an independent subset of data, which is called either validation or testing subset, depending on the situation. Uh, and it is significantly, uh, the, the performance is significantly uh, better Sometimes we can see an error. Uh, 
Uh, and now observe what happens for yellow waves. And it's basically the same, right? So sometimes we have the point predicted really well, sometimes we can see errors. So basically, the model performs the same for uh, training and validation. Is it the perfect model? We don't know. But do we observe overheating? We are sure we don't observe overheating, right? So the training and validation performance is on the same level. It doesn't mean that it needs to be exact. Here, the validation is a bit higher. It doesn't really matter. The point is that it's not, um, it's not an order of magnitude difference, right? <coughs> now let's look at the second one. And for that, even though all the green points are predicted perfectly well, most of the yellow ones produce large values of errors, which is a, a sign of overheating. So now we know that even though the first model was maybe not the best one, the second model, the black one, is for sure uh, a product of overheating. So we will not uh, want to use that in the future. Okay, uh, any questions about overheating and model complexity? So let's talk a little bit about practical uses of regression. Uh, the most straightforward uh, usage of regression is general interpretation of data, and this is what we've already covered. So this is this uh, car retail problem, how to get a price for a car. Uh, you could probably give me a lot of examples right now of practical use of regression. Uh, could you maybe try to do that? Because this might be a question that will be more than that. So let's pick some examples together. So uh, if you, for example, measure the performance of the engine in the Data 
set, we we'll fit them all into this data set, and from now on, we don't need to actually measure this target value, we can infer it from data. This is this most straightforward usage of regression. But we have other uses, as I will be talking about them right now. <coughs> we can use it for data imputation. What is data imputation? You can basically define it as filling gaps in data. So you have a lot of data, but you see some lacking measurements, let's say, uh, and you can use regression in order to solve that. So for example, <coughs> rather than the characteristic of an engine, you have your rotation per minute, and you have, let's say, RMS of vibration of this engine. And some values are missing because of equipment failure, for example. And now you might fit a regression model into this data to actually tell you where to, uh, where to expect uh, real value to be. So we are assuming that uh, we have data something somebody is missing, and then we can regression model to predict these missing values. Now the regression. <coughs> Again, imagine that we have the same characteristic as before. Uh, you measure a lot of parameters of your, uh, your engine and you feel that one value is off. That uh, in this particular position, the RMS of vibration should not actually be here. This seems like an outlier, right? Maybe someone dropped the tool or the sensor while it was measuring and therefore the amplitude of vibration is much higher. So, what can we do? Uh, we can assume that uh, yeah, uh, our measurement, let's say, consists of a lot of features. So we are measuring a lot of stuff regarding our engine. And what we want to do is we can fit a regression model to predict one of these measured uh, elements given the others. So let's say that our RMS is this Xn here, and we are training our model to predict RMS given all the other things that we predict. And right now, uh, our model says, here is the expected value. And distance between this prediction and the real measurement uh, can be used to infer whether it is an outlier or novelty or not. So regression can be used to correct uh, data duration procedures. So if we have a large data set, we can use regression algorithms to fit uh, data samples that feel off. Yeah, and we can mark it as novelty, and maybe ignore, or maybe do data imputation because of the, of the measurement. And finally, prediction. Uh, so let's say that we are measuring some uh, points in time. Uh, so these are moments in time and some measurements that are taken. What can it be? Maybe a global temperature. Or maybe, uh, let's say, a stock price of a particular company. Uh, and based on that, we can actually fit a <laughs> model <coughs> which will tell us what will happen in the future. Uh, does it work? Okay, or does it work uh, correctly all the time? Not really, right? Because uh, we can only predict few steps at the time, and we are not able to predict unexpected events. Uh, at some point, I was, uh, we were writing a grant proposal together with uh, Polish railroads, so PKP, uh, and they wanted us to build a decision support system that uh, would be able to predict future behavior of markets, future behavior of passengers, so uh, schedule maintenance and so on and so on. Uh, and they really insisted that our system, since it would be AI, it would be very intelligent, would be able to predict future uh, pandemics, like COVID pandemic, or future wars, like the Ukraine war. And the problem is that uh, just getting trend uh, extended into the future will not allow us to predict something unexpected ever. Right? So, prediction based on regression is doable, 
provided that the trend will not change. And this is something to uh, remember for the future, because you might be asked by somebody in the future to, let's say, <coughs> build models for future prediction. It never works apart from that particular concept. <coughs> okay, so uh, to sum up, uh, these are as usual things to remember for the next test. Uh, I believe that the next test will be only uh, about regression and the final two lectures, classification and uh, advanced data uh, processing and interpretation, will be together for the final test. And we will not be covering this uh, right here, uh, but you have it in your notes to help you learn from it. However, since this is a middle lecture, uh, of the semester, I would ask you to provide me some feedback regarding how you feel on this subject uh, and answer these three questions for me. So uh, please uh, pass uh, the rest of the